Hey, this is the uh, introduction to resurrection, Tchias Amesim. And he explains that the soul itself is pure on the absolute level. It's holy. It's God's creation, which has no relevance to anything within the physical realm. It's naturally part of eternity. The body, on the other hand, is made of earth, earthiness, lack of refinement. It possesses every negative characteristic. And that's why a man is inclined to everything which is the antithesis of spirituality. Self-absorbed in satisfying those needs, those desires, those aspirations. That's what the physical is all about. You know, there's an expression in the vernacular. He's an animal. What is that? What is the connotation? He's an animal. Animal means every characteristic of what an animal represents, this person displays that those characteristics. No conscience. Purely driven by desire, which is all inclination. Man is inclined. You know, have you ever stopped to think for a moment? What's an incline? Something's there's an incline. That means it's on the downhill. There's an incline. Man is tipped. In terms of the physicality of human being, we're tipped in negative direction. We're inclined to do that. You speak about a person being special. He's an upscale person. Inclined is downward. It connotes negativity. Neg negative. Everything within the physical represents the negative. The soul represents the positive. As we mentioned yesterday, God created the human being as a composite of physical and spiritual. And he infused the soul into the physical body, which caused it to become a living entity. To become a living entity, if the objective is not to spiritualize the physicality and to refine and purify and spiritualize and upgrade the physical to the spiritual, it would have been enough to give the human being a life source as every living creature has a life source, no relevance to spirituality. Why did God have to infuse the human being with a soul? The soul being of such overwhelming level of holiness, the objective is to spiritualize the body. That if a person makes a sufficient amount of decisions, takes enough initi initiatives in life through the study of Torah and through doing mitzvos, which are all acts of sanctification, the body will be elevated from the physical state to a spiritual state, although its makeup is physical. The example I always give on the, the temple on Yom Kippur, the Jews would gather on Yom Kippur. And the Beis Amigdosh had a finite amount of space. The Jews, when they were there to hear the service of Yom Kippur from the high priest, they would stand pressed together to the point that you'd be able to lift up your feet and you would not fall. That's how pressed they were. And they would hear the incantation of the name of Hashem by the high priest. Every Jew would prostrate himself and there'd be enough room for full prostration. How is it possible? We're talking about it's a physical location which is a finite amount of space. When they stand directly, they're pressed. When they hear the name of God being intoned by the high priest, they bow and they prostrate themselves. How's it possible? 
you realize the walls didn't expand. Because the whole concept of limitation only has relevance to the physical realm, not to the spiritual realm. So though the physical makeup of the temple was marble and stone, which is physical, but its context was spiritual. It was elevated that it took on spiritual characteristics. And spiritual is unlimited. It's not finite. So therefore, as a result of that, when it came to bow, there was enough room to prostrate themselves. Although when they stood directly, they were pressed together. The objective of the neshama, what we call the soul, which is the most holiest entity in creation, is to spiritualize the body. And although the body is physical, but to elevate and advance it, that its physicality should take on a spiritual context and become ultimately part of eternity. Give you an example. When a person dies and he's laid to rest in the ground, what happens to the body? The body decomposes. The Torah tests to the fact that Moshe Rabbeinu, when he passed away, although he died, the Torah tells us that his vigor, his strength, did not in any way wane, even in the grave. Even when he died in the grave, not only did he not decompose, he had the freshness of a living human being. How is it possible? The soul departs, the body naturally decomposes. Like everything in the physical withers if it's no longer connected to the life source. Not only motion did he not wither, he re retained all the freshness of a, a physical living human being. The answer is very simple. Because Moshe Rabbeinu, who passed away the day he was born, 120 years, on his 120th birthday, every moment of his life was fully invested in spirituality, since physicality was spiritualized. Spiritualized, something that's spiritualized to such an extent is not subject to decomposition. It's not subject to withering. Because he met the maximum potential of he was fully invested, that every aspect of his being was fully invested in the service of God. So therefore, his context was fully spiritual. Didn't decompose. There's a famous story, you know, the Vilna Gone passed away at the beginning of the 19th century, very beginning. And I think he was about 76 years old, maybe 74 years old. And he was buried in Vilna, in the cemetery in Vilna. And the Russians or the Lithuanians, they wanted to put a road there and his body had to be exhumed to move the grave to another location within the cemetery. It was a known fact. The Vilnagon had passed away over 100 years earlier. When they took him out of the grave, he looked like a person sleeping. He did not deteriorate as much as Nyota in the grave. How's that possible? Every other corpse, as it says in Pirkei Ovos, your food for the worms and the maggots. Now, what does the maggot eat? What does the maggot nourish on? And the worms. Something that's physical. Something that has a spiritual context. Although its makeup is physical, the maggot doesn't go near it, and the worm doesn't go near it. Therefore, the body of the Vilna Gone did not decompose, did not deteriorate. And they say the people were there, he looked like the person was sleeping in the grave. Fully serene sleeping in the grave. That's what was Vilna Gone. Because in his lifetime, he invested every aspect of his being to spiritualize it. So he elevated his physicality and brought it to a spiritual plane. And that's the objective of life. 
At Sinai, God gave us Torah mitzvos. The only way we're able to counter the evil inclination, we're talking about inclination, meaning you're on the incline. How do you straighten it out and turn it upward? You know, it's interesting. It's known if a plane is nose diving, unless you pull it up real quick, it's going to go into the oblivion and disintegrate when it hits even into the ocean. You have to pull up that nose to level it, and then it should go upward. The body is inclined to everything corrupt, perverted. That's the natural, natural inclination of the body. God gave us 613 commandments, 248 positive commandments. The one that encompasses the totality of everything is the study of Torah. The antidote to the evil inclination to steady that course, to turn it upward, is the Torah itself. The Torah is the ultimate spiritualization that spiritualizes the body. It spiritualizes the physicality. It expunges it of that evil inclination. It's no longer inclined to evil. And that's why It brings about that ultimate level of spiritualization. We mentioned the text of the blessing before you do a mitzvah. It says, Asher kidshonu b'mitzvosov. You sanctified us through your mitzvos. Before we do a mitzvah, before you put on your talis, before you put on the tefillin, you say, Asher kidshonu. You've sanctified us to put on tefillin. To enwrap ourselves with the talus, alachilas matzah, to eat the matzah, the taking of the lulav, sitting in the sukkah, all these actions are actions of spiritualization, sanctification. God gave us these mitzvahs to take the mundane, the physical, and sanctify it, to elevate it, that although it's a physical makeup, but the innate value is spiritual. And that's the objective of life. Well, we call it in just ordinary terms, refinement, but it's much more than refinement. It's taking it from one realm into another realm. A person who's a Torah scholar is not a Torah sage. In Hebrew, a Torah scholar is called a Talmud Chacham. How, what is that? It's not a person who's knowledgeable. It's a person who has the Torah, the knowledge integrated in his life that, as we say in Pirkei Avos, it's Lumina Maslasos. We study to actualize it. The study, the information becomes part of our behavior. It becomes our lifestyle. It becomes our thought process. We live it, we breathe it, we act it. We sense it. So what was in place of our emotion before, we have human emotions. But what is the temperament? The temperament's a different temperament. Now there's a famous personality in the Talmud. We've mentioned his name a number of times. It was Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa. Rabchanina, the son of Dosa, which the Talmud tells us that every day there's a heavenly voice that comes out from Sinai that announces to the world that in the merit of Rabchanina ben Dosa, he was a man who was so poor, all he had for his weekly fare, weekly fare, a measure of carob from Erev Shabbos to Erev Shabbos. He had nothing. He literally lived at the lowest level of subsistence. And the Heavenly voice calls out to the world every day. The whole world is sustained in the merit of Hanida ben Dosa, my son, my beloved son, which for him it's sufficient, this measure of care from week to week. It's sufficient. He doesn't need more than that. That's who he is. 
Rabchini Bedoso, the Talmud tells over a story. He wanted to cut wheat for matzah for Pesach. Now, if the wheat after it's cut becomes wet, it's a problem. Because the moment the water comes onto that cut wheat, it starts fermenting. And if it ferments, that's the leavening process. It can no longer be used for matzah. So he had this donkey piled with the harvest of the wheat that he needed for matzo. And he's traveling with an Arab who's the mule driver. And they come to a river. Arab Hanid Mendoza, just to give you some background. And Talmud tells us a story. There was a poisonous lizard that came out of its lair and it was biting people and people were dying from it. So they came over, Hanim Dosa says, you, know, you have to take care of this menace. And instead, he'd run the exterminating company, Hanim Mendoza. So he says to the people, just show me where its hole is in the ground. So, so what did he do? They show him exactly where, where it comes out of the ground and he takes his foot and puts it over the hole. And what happens? And this poisonous lizard bites Reb Hanin and Mendoza. And after bites Reb Hanin and Mendoza, the poisonous lizard dies. So Reb Hanin and Mendoza takes this large lizard, puts it on the shoulder, parades through the city, and says, it's not the lizard that kills, it's the sin that kills. And they said, they used to say, woe to the person who met up with this lizard. And woe to the lizard that met up with Reb Hanin and Mendoza. That's what he used to say. Meaning, when this lizard bit this man, although he was a human being, when you bit into him, you didn't bite into a regular person. He bit into a piece of holiness. Therefore, that lizard cannot tolerate that holiness. Therefore, it died. So, Rebbechanin comes to this river. So it wasn't a miracle he didn't die. His makeup was a different makeup. He had a spiritual makeup, although he was a physical human being. He comes to this river, and he has this donkey laden with wheat, and he has a problem, because if the donkey wades through the river, the wheat gets wet, becomes wet, can't be used for matzo, and he has an Arab with him. So he goes to the river, he says, river split. The river doesn't split. He says, again, river split, I have to go through. The river splits, he goes through with his donkey and the wheat, but his Arab attendant was left behind. And Rebbechini those needs his Arab attendant to accommodate him. To be, He's the mule driver. So the river time flowed as normally flows. So Rebbechini Mendoza says to the river, River split for the Arab attendant. Doesn't split. He says, I say split. And if you don't split, I will decree on this location, water shall ever flow ever again. Rabbi Mendoza. What happens? The moment he says that, the river splits. The Arab goes across. He says, Rabbi Mendoza, transporting the wheat on the donkey, on the mule. Is that a miracle? Perform the miracle. Did he have to do some kind of incantation? Some Kabbalistic incantation which he caused the river to split? The answer is no. Why did God create this world? For one purpose. This is the so-called the playing field for God's glory. And if you want a God's soldiers, and you represent him in every aspect of your being. The river, nature is meant to accommodate this kind of person. That's what nature was created for. It's only natural because people don't behave as they should behave. We behave as physical beings. But if we would behave as spiritual beings, nature would be bound to our behavior, to accommodate us. But it's only because we live within nature, which is purely physical, and we allow physical to dictate our lives. Therefore, nature, we're bound to nature. Nature is not bound to us. Rabbi Chinin Mendoza, he spiritualizes. He was a spiritual person. He had enough, a small measure of carob. From Erev Shabbos to Erev Shabbos, the whole world is sustained in his merit. 
He has barely, he has nothing to eat. The world is wallowing in wealth and bounty in his merit. The river is not meant to in any way interfere or infringe on Reb Hanindos' movement. It's created to accommodate him. And if it doesn't, it doesn't exist. And that's what he says, I will decree water should never flow on this location again. I always mention the Rambam in the laws of Tshuva writes that every Jew could be as great as Moshe Rabbeinu. We just said, Moshe Rabbeinu did not decompose in the ground. Moshe Rabbeinu radiated holiness as the Torah attested his fact. Moshe Rabbeinu spoke openly face to face with God. You think God will speak to us? So what does it mean every Jew could be as great as Moshe Rabbeinu? What was Moshe Rabbeinu's accomplishment? Every Jew has a potential. We can't be more than what we're meant to be. But whatever we're meant to be, if we achieve that level of accomplishment, we're no less than Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu's claim to fame was that whatever his potential was, he met every aspect of that potential. Therefore, he was Moshe. If we meet every aspect of our potential and do not fall short of that potential, in terms of the effect of our decisions, our initiatives would have the same result. You can't be more than God allows you to be. But that's the objective. When the prophet says that, why did I create this world? The prophet says, name of God, I created this world for my glory, for my glory. We've been speaking all along, God created this world that man should be a beneficiary of God's goodness. What does that mean for his glory? Meaning, if you live your life and take initiatives and invest it in God's glory, then you merit everything. The ultimate objective is you should be a beneficiary. But to achieve that, to be the beneficiary, you have to take the physical and spiritualize it by utilizing your life for God's glory. And that's why a person who gives his life to sanctify God's name, that's the ultimate glory. There's nothing more precious to a human being than his own life. And if you're willing to give your life when God says you should give your life, although you have the, you have the choice not to give your life, but despite that you do give your life, that means you're giving every aspect of your existence to God, that's the ultimate level of spiritualization. That's, that's called, you die to Al-Kiddush Hashem, and that's what we say in the Shema. You should love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your possessions. That's at all, every aspect of your being. And if you do that, that brings about this level of refinement. This upgrades, that brings about this transition from the physical to the spiritual. You take on a whole different connotation of value. You know, the Talmud tells a story. One of the great rabbis of the Talmud, he was known as Abaye. Abaye was his name, and he had a colleague by the name of Rova, Rova Abaye. And Abaye was one of the great Torah, sage, Torah sages of the Talmud. And he hears a man and woman. She was a married woman. And he, he overhears a conversation that they're going to rendezvous in the swamps, in the marshes, and they're going to commit adultery. Yeah. So Abaye goes, and the two of them, they start walking into the marshes in the secluded location, and they're going to commit adultery there. And Abaye, he trails them into the marshes to see what's going to happen. And he's hiding behind a tree. And he hears the man saying to the woman, or the man, woman saying to the man, you know, doesn't make any sense. I'm not going to commit adultery. If this is what it takes to commit adultery, it's not worth it. Can't complicate our lives with this. I'm not interested. I'm not going to cross that line. It's too complicated. Every time we want to have relations, sexual, we have to go into the marshes. We're not going. And they backed away from it and they went home. It never happened. 
Abai sees this, and immediately he's overtaken by a, a sense of inadequacy because he feels that if he would have been put in this moment of temptation, he doesn't think he could have resisted the temptation. And here you have these two ordinary people, they're able to resist it. And he, this great Torah sage, he's not able to resist it. So he comes back and he comes back to the study hall, he's outside and he's sulking. Nobody knows why. So his colleague says to him, Robo, this is what are you sulking about? And he tells him the story that he feels that if he would have been in that position, he doesn't think he could have resisted. He would have succumbed to temptation. And here I'm supposed to be this great, holy Torah sage. So he says to me, you don't understand. Because of who you are, you're a bigger catch than these little guys. These people are little people. Satan wants to get the big catch. That although you're at the top of the mountain, he wants to take you off, push you off the top of that mountain. So therefore he will cause that your desire should be at an irresistible level. The ordinary guy means nothing. You know, assassinate a president, that's called an assassination. You assassinate a bookie on the street. You know how many bookies are on the street? These kind of people, dime a dozen. But a person of prestige status, who's considered a prince of God, if you're able to go and sully him, oh, that's a great accomplishment. So again, it's to take that spiritual person who's refined himself, who's upgraded it, and go and desecrate it. That is the ultimate challenge. And that's what Satan tries to do. And that's what his colleague explained to him. It's not an inadequacy in you. It's only because of who you are. That's why sometimes the challenge is greater than an ordinary person. I'll tell you, it's very interesting. It's a rule of thumb, and this very, and it's what life's all about. God brings merit to the meritorious. An ordinary person doesn't merit special merit. And let's say there's a certain opportunity that you can make a difference in the world, on the world scene, or in a very significant way. You think God is going to allow an ordinary person to do this? You have to have special merit to have merit. If you don't have sufficient merit, God will not put you in that driver's seat. A person who has that merit, understand, when you know you have that ability and you want to do something, Satan's always there to trip you up. Because if you trip up and you do something wrong, God forbid, you become disqualified because you're no longer meritorious. God brings merit to the meritorious. But if he somehow, God forbid, should trip you up that you should do the wrong thing, you're no longer meritorious. And if you're no longer meritorious, you can't bring about that result that you could have brought about. You know, during um, the 10 days of, of repentance, every day we say, Avino al Kenu. Or on the fast day, we say, oh, you know, our father, our king. And we say certain things and we make requests. And during the, the 10 days of repentance, we say, Kosvenu, write us into the book of this, the book of that. Or during the year, we say, remember us for that. And we say, Kosvenu, Sefer Hazchuyos. Inscribe us in the book of merit. What's the book of merit? Being inscribed in the Book of Merit means that you can be one of the meritorious ones. If you're in the Book of Merit, God will use you as the vehicle to bring about merit, which is a tremendous thing, which is not so simple. But even if you're inscribed, you can be disqualified. And Satan tries to do that. They always say, a person who raises a child responsibly and puts endless years of input, education, refinement, mentoring that person. And that person, God forbid, is taken by some, by some vagrant. When that vagrant took the life of that special person, did he have to understand what that person was? 
You kill an animal, you kill a rodent, you kill a human being, to that person's all the same. But God forbid to the person who raised that child and mentored that child and understands the value of the child and the potential of that child, the loss is not to be imagined. Because the innate value, not because it's only his child, but because the innate value of that value of that child, the spiritualization, it's the function, what it's able to provide for humanity, to the world, has been taken. Like you would take take an insect or take an unintelligible animal. To that person who took it, it's all the same. How do we know the Jew himself has that ability to bring about that level of transformation within him? If we say saving one life of the Jew, one life is the equivalent of saving the whole world. What does that mean? What is the potential within that one Jew? That means every Jew has a special soul. The Jewish soul is not the same as the non-Jewish soul. Because you have that spiritual core, that spiritual core has the ability to transform through action every aspect of your physical being, to take the animal and refine it to be the equivalent of an angel within human, within life. That's what you have the ability to do. That only tells you the innate potential of every Jew. If one Jew is the equivalent of the whole world, one Jew is equivalent to 8 billion people, what does that mean? It means because that's the potential of that person. But the potential is all based on the, the, the makeup of the person, which is the core, which is the soul of the Jew. And every one of us has that. Now the question is, but life is choice. But to bring about that result, that spiritualization, you must need endless, multiple initiatives to bring that about. And if you have sufficient and you try and you do chuba, because nobody's perfect, and we recognize where, we, where our weaknesses are, and we try to shore it up, then the end result is something which is very positive.